So it seemed this week, given that Monday falls on St. Valentine's Day, that it would be fitting to talk about relationship, sexuality, eros, desire, that kind of stuff, in case that's part of any of your lives. Um, And I do it with some hesitation, temerity, because I think about the recent fight that I had with my wife, actually, (laughs) in which I was upset because she was complaining about some things that I didn't think she should be complaining about, and she was upset because I was being blaming and judgmental, and then it kind of escalated from there. You know, don't you teach non-judgment, right? (laughs) (laughs) That kind of thing. So, and uh, when I think about the marriages of many of my colleagues, Buddhist teachers, Tibetan lamas, and so forth. You know how it is. It's like that, right? (laughs) So you can listen with a certain, what's the right phrase? Um, Yeah, just kind of listen and see if it makes any sense (laughs) to you. (laughs) It becomes begin so importantly and amazingly, you could say, the conversation with love, really, because life begins and ends with love. We seek love. Maybe you could say we are love. As the poet Rumi writes, don't fill the wine jar again and again. Break the jar and jump into the ocean of wine. Satisfy yourself. So, um, some years ago, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is currently in his first uh, return to Vietnam in 40 years, he's on a three-month teaching tour and pilgrimage in Vietnam, and stories I've heard are really quite wonderful about his being back there finally. But anyway, Thich Nhat Hanh was giving a set of lectures in Plum Village in this community in France, and he was going to give them on the Brahma Viharas, the teachings of loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and equanimity, and he started to do that. And people listened like you're listening, and they were kind of sitting there, and after a while, it started to get a little bit, you know, sleepy, like, it's okay, Buddhist teachings, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And then he paused for a moment, and he said, she was 21 years old when I first saw her walking down the steps of this temple in Dong Lai, or whatever this village was in Vietnam, and she moved like an angel, and I fell in love immediately, and everyone kind of sat up. <laughs> and he began this beautiful book, actually, that was published from these lectures. One chapter was the traditional Buddhist teachings about loving kindness and compassion, and then the alternate chapters were the story of falling in love with this young nun. Um, and uh, it caught people's attention. Pablo Neruda, so wonderful. The captain's verses. <coughs> he writes, You know how this is. If I look at the crystal moon, at the red branch of the slow autumn at my window, if I touch near the fire the impalpable ash or the wrinkled body of the log, everything carries me to you as if everything that exists, aromas, light, metals, were little boats that sail toward those isles of yours that wait for me. This whole book of verses of love and passion and seeing the beloved everywhere. Or Rumi again, where are you? Where he writes... If you're bored and contemptuous, love is a walk in a meadow. If you're stranded somewhere and exhausted, love is an Arabian horse. The ocean feeds itself to fish. If you're ocean fish, why bother with bread? If I were a rose in this spring, I would change into a hundred rose bushes. Why turn around this frustrated body tethered in the barn when you could be free in the infinite pasture of love? All these poems about love begin with love. I mean, where do we think we come from? Come out of love in some fashion. I saw a bumper sticker that said, 
born all right the first time. (laughs) So the Buddha says, O nobly born, you who are born all right the first time, you who are the sons and daughters of the awakened ones, pay attention to this capacity of the heart to love. And it's an interesting thing because we talk about love and desire tonight and eros, you know, that the thing that's gotten reduced to the little <laughs> cupid on Valentine's cards, but actually the arrows are much more, um, they can become great weapons, as you probably well know. Um, there's a kind of mistranslation in Buddhist teachings about desire because people hear the teachings that somehow get translated, you shouldn't desire, and that the, the, the freedom in your life will come when you no longer desire. But actually, that mistranslation loses the reality that there are different kinds of desire. The word in Sanskrit or Pali is chetana, which is the will to do, just the energy of life. And it can be associated with skillful things. Here is the Buddha in the story, anyway, having been enlightened at age 35 and then living for till he was 80 years old. And every morning he would get up and he would get his food and he would bathe himself and he would teach and he would sit under the shade of a tree when it was hot to be cool and so forth. And if it wasn't desire, what was it that moved him to do that, to feed himself, to seek shade and so forth? Um, Where's this poem? No matter what we are and who, some duties everyone must do. A poet puts aside his wreath to wash his face and brush his teeth. And even earls must comb their curls, and even kings have under things (laughs) for Valentine's Day. So there is some energy of life, of choosing, of acting, of feeding, of caring for oneself, for the world that we're connected with, that's different than desire. It is the wise or healthy movement of the heart, and it can be motivated by love, by connection, by caring. And then there is what's normally translated and mistranslated in desire as that which is unskillful desire, and that simply translated as grasping and greed um, and the rapaciousness of it in its extreme that you know creates the sufferings of the world. It's neediness and addiction um, and uh, the blindness of desire. As the saying says in India, when a pickpocket meets a saint, he sees only the saint's pockets, right? That what you want blinds you to anything else. If you're hungry and you walk down the street, what you see are restaurants. Oh, there's Joe LaCoco's Pizza, could have that. Oh, there's a nice Mexican restaurant. You know, you don't see antique stores or flower shops. You know how that is. And we can get lost in the world of seeking again and again a kind of blind fulfillment, what my friend Janine Roth sometimes calls feeding the hungry heart where we use substitutes, food or other things, to feed a kind of deep longing or grasping or holding on. So you can hear the difference between these, what might be called healthy desire, and then the desire that I wouldn't even call it unhealthy, the kinds of desire that make suffering. That's all. And you know about both of them. You've studied them plenty in your life, right? (laughs) And the question then is, how do we awaken? How do we become free? And if you look at the story of the Buddha, part of it is one of extremes. I think this is why the desire thing got also translated in this way. Because first the Buddha had a rather stupendously um, uh, well-developed erotic life. Uh, Let's see, where's the passage? In um, the myth of the Buddha, his father, the king, wanting the Buddha to stay in the palaces and not go off as the, as the uh, um, kind of uh, prophet said at the Buddha's birth, he'll either stay in the family business and stay and be a king like you, or he'll leave the company and go out and become a 
a wanderer and a great teacher, and his father tried to keep him in the palace. Everyone knows this story. And wanting Gautama to follow in his footsteps, his father tried to keep him home by surrounding him with sensual and sexual pleasures. It is said in the text that the king had a special chamber of love constructed for Gautama, decorated with erotic art, illuminated with subdued light. Captivated by sexual extravagance, the prince spent his days and nights in continual dalliance, experiencing every imaginable sens- sensual, every imaginable sensual desire, delight of the body. So that was one side of the Buddha's history, as the story goes anyway. You know, the summer of love in San Francisco, then the Castro, then he moved on to Rome and Paris, and you know, he had all of that. And then at some point he realized that that wasn't going to fulfill him completely. So he became a renunciate, all of that. But in terms of desire, then he tried the opposite. All right, I'm not, that didn't work. I'm going, to do, I'm going to try and get rid of my desires through self-torture. And he did all the forms of ascetic practices that India offers um, because he saw desire as what he called the golden cage. Let me get out of it by not doing anything, not eating, f- fasting, and not looking, not wanting anything. But of course, that form of self-torture became another cage. And then finally the realization came of liberation in the form of the middle path, which is neither being lost in seeking pleasure and desire and grasping greed on one side, and on the other hand, not rejecting the world, not running away from the world. And the middle path is um, lots of descriptions of it. One simple description is it's just being where we are without grasping and resisting, but opening the eyes and the heart to what's present right here and now. This is the wakefulness or freedom of life. Um, But the middle path then plays out in a a wide range of ways for people's lives. For monks and nuns, um, the middle path means renouncing the world of sensuality. It is with passion as with fire and water. They are good Um, servants, but bad masters. So for the monastic order, sensuality was talked about as a kind of danger. I remember this. Um, And there's a beautiful story, Ajahn Sumedho, my friend in England, has when they were casting a Buddha image for his big temple in England, um, many, many people came for this special ceremony to create the image of the Buddha as a kind of central reminder in the monastery. And the last thing they cast quite separately is the little flame that sticks out of the top of the Buddha's head, which is really the flame of radiant awakening. And before they cast it, all the people come and they do this special chanting ceremony. And then um, people throw in their jewelry. They're, you know, they'll take off their, their rings and necklaces and various things of value and throw that in. And Ajahn Sumedho said he had a bag of wedding rings that people had given him over the years who'd gotten divorced and didn't know what to do with them, their wings, and finally brought them to the temple. <coughs> and as he said, um, see if I can find that passage. He said, what better thing to do with the ring when the marriage is over? With What better to do with the symbol of its joys and sorrows than to transform whatever happened into a Buddha? And that was the outer symbol of it. Um, but to take that, Um, the metal of everyone's materialism and vanity and superstition and their loves and hates and broken hearts, all of the things that were represented in some of those gifts anyway, and transform them into the light of awakening. And this is what we did in a symbolic way. Um, And it's really what is possible in the path. Now, one of my teachers, Mahasi Saida, who came here from Burma to teach (laughs) years ago, we brought him to America. Somebody asked him about practicing with sexuality, and he'd been a celibate monk since he was a boy. Since he was eight years old, he was in robes. <coughs> and he said, oh, sexuality, that's gross, base, and disgusting. That was his reply, which didn't go over really well with the people <laughs> sitting there. And later on, in the, at the end of that retreat, it was a three-month retreat we were teaching, we had Dharma Follies. We had a kind of um, theater piece that just looked at 
the, what we were doing from another perspective, which I think was very healthy. And one of the staff members got up and dressed herself to look somewhat like the master from Burma and said, I have a lecture to give you about sexuality. And someone poses the student and asks the same question. And she said, yes, it is engrossing, basic, and worth discussing. Right? <laughs> So on one side, there's the kind of celibacy, you know, it's dangerous for monastics because then you leave the monastery. So that's the kind of way that it's held there. On the other side, the middle path taught for householders, as the Buddha says, the um, life of a householder includes the pleasures of the world, the five strands of sensual pleasure. And as long as they are um, followed in a wise and skillful way, they are the um, part of the gift or the benefit of living as a householder. Um, Carl Jung puts it in another fashion. Um, he says, the erotic instinct is something questionable and will always be so, whatever a future set of laws may have to say on the matter. It belongs on one hand to our original animal nature, which exists as long as humans have an animal body. On the other hand, it is connected with the highest form of spirit, but it blooms only when spirit and instinct are in true harmony. If one or the other aspect is missing, then an injury occurs, or at least there's a one-sided lack of balance that slips into pathology. Too much of the animal disfigures the civilized human being. Too much culture makes for a sick animal. And so for the path of the householder, there is this possibility of balance that Jung describes in that passage, which is um, to awaken to these energies and to use them for our own liberation and freedom. Now, if we begin to look at desire and love and eros and so forth and begin to actually study it, we can see that there's like different channels, just like you can turn on different channels, you know, with your remote, um, the sports channel or the Playboy channel or whatever it happens to be, the shopping channel and so forth, that love is kind of the same thing in Eros. Um, and we can get um, connected with it in such deep ways. Um, some of it can be simply desire for pleasure. I love ice cream. You know, I love this taste. I love this particular kind of sense experience. I love this erotic experience. And there's a kind of just liking for it and wanting more of it. That's one level. Just notice that. And notice how it is to fulfill it. I and mean, it's really kind of wonderful. And then it ends. And then it comes again. And it seems to be that fulfilling it doesn't really quench it. I mean, the interesting thing, when you get your favorite flavor of ice cream, there you are going out, you know, and you're imagining, I really want to go to um, Cold Stone and get um, uh, Devonshire, you know, double cream, clotted cream ice cream mixed with, uh, you know, these kind of nuts and, and some chocolate sauce on it or something. You have your whole fantasy and you're there, you know, thinking about it in your apartment or your place, and then you decide to go down to San Rafael or wherever the, your ice cream place is. And the whole way, there's this tremendous visualization and salivation, right? And then finally you get there and they're making it for you and you see it and you're about to have it and there's this whole kind of welling up of delight. And then you get it and you take one bite of it and it's really good, okay? And the minute you take the bite, you feel, oh, oh, already I'm better. I'm so happy. <laughs> and part of what makes you happy is the taste good. It's true. But a lot of what makes you happy is that the desire has gone away, that you fulfilled the desire. It doesn't really, I mean, it's like we, you're sitting there at the end of the sitting and you're, you know, nudgy and restless and so forth, and you can't wait for the bell to ring. And then finally... And you're incredibly happy for a moment. Oh, my God, the bell fang finally rang, right? And why are you happy? You haven't even moved. You're exactly the same as you were, right? 
<laughs> except the bell rang. And what made you happy was the cessation of the desire, that no longer were you in that place of wanting. Instead, you just were sitting there. You could actually sit for a while longer, right? <laughs> so there's this kind, the, 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 the love of, of something, the ice cream or the bell to ring. And then there's businessman's love, right? Which is, I'll love you if you love me with, you know, a few little <laughs> fine print in the contract. <laughs> It's a sort of exchange where we take care of one another. It's fine. We're just sort of looking at these, paying attention to them. And there's erotic love, the kind of sensual, sexual eros that's got its own beauty to it. We talked about, and then there's brotherly, sisterly love. And you read in the texts and the stories of the beautiful uh, community of love around the Buddha, where the Buddha walks in one monastery and all these people are living there, monks and their partner, the nuns and their place in the forest and so forth. And he says, how goes it with you? Or some simple question like that. How is it going? And the abbot says, it goes very well. And the Buddha says, what does it mean that it goes well? And the abbot says, we are living together like milk and water, viewing one another with kindly eyes. And there's just this great sense when you hear about the disciples of the Buddha, the the teachers around him and the, the, the community, that there's this love that people enter into when they come into the monastery and they see the kind of respect and care that each person is treating the other. And the monks would wander through the village and people would just want to follow them back because there was such a beautiful feeling of deep friendship and connection. This, you know, ice cream love, businessman's love, erotic love, brotherly love. There's metta. There's the love of loving kindness, um, which isn't the love of desire, but the love of the heart that sees the happiness of another as being a part of the happiness of ourself. It really breaks down the boundaries, a deeper kind of love. And it really is who we are in the end and has a tremendous power that kind of love we all know from moments in our life. It's the love that allows a mother to pick up a car that's rolled on her child and do unbelievable things. It's the love that a mother or lioness or wolf or something will use to protect her children. And it's that same love or wolf that will have that mother kick the cubs out when they're big enough um, because that's what they need. It's a love that is so connected with the well-being of another that it sacrifices itself for the well-being of another. And you can hear actually how happier making the love is as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, as our identity, as our heart grows bigger. Not that one is right or wrong. And I remember sitting on one retreat and actually having the experience of two different hearts in myself. There was a kind of personal love, my daughter, my wife, and the the gardeners, the people that I knew around me, a very deep personal love. And then there was a different dimension of the heart that was simply love for all beings, for all life. And it felt really different. And one wasn't right or wrong. There are different aspects of this divine spirit of who we really are as we open up. So... Lal Didi, who was a, a Sarabia, where are you? Let me see. Yeah, Lal Didi, who was a great um, kind of uh, saint and ecstatic in India. She writes, On the way, the difficulties feel like being ground by a millstone on the way to love like night coming at noon, like lightning through the clouds. But don't worry. What must come, comes. Face everything with love. Now, wherever I look, everything is new. The mind is new, the moon, the sun. The whole world looks rinsed with water, washed in the rain of I am that, and that is what I am. And Lala leaps and dances inside the energy that creates and sustains the universe. And this is the love like gravity. I mean, maybe that's what gravity is. No one really knows. They just describe the laws of it, but no one knows what gravity is. But what do you think attracts the sun and the earth and 
the stars and everybody in the universe wants to get back together again. A cosmic allurement. It is the pull of the universe toward itself, toward the oneness from which it comes. And this is felt in our consciousness as love. So then you say, oh, that's so beautiful. How do we do it? Oh, nobly born. How about in relationships? There's all these levels, and you can see it even in one day. There's the businessman's love. I can see it in my marriage. Yeah, I'll do this. I'll, I'll go do the shopping, you know, if you cook the dinner or whatever that kind of thing is. And the erotic love and the meta and the caring for her well-being as much as my own. And the ice cream part and all of that. Relationships, you know, are they for meeting our needs? For sure. But is that all? Is there some other possibility? What levels can our love open us to? When I do marriage ceremonies, which I haven't in recent years much, except for a couple of very close friends, but I used to do quite a few of them, um, one of the things that I would do would be to talk to the people who are getting married in front of everybody else who was there and say, you know, this marriage isn't starting today. These people are getting married because the love between them has already grown very deep, and now they've asked us to come together to witness this love and to help hold them in that. It's kind of the community of love around them. And I've married all kinds of couples, and you know, heterosexual and gay and lesbian and probably other kinds as well. But anyway. Um, and one of the things that I talk about is, um, well, Suzuki Roshi says it very nicely in this little story. He says, when helping Suzuki Roshi prepare for a marriage ceremony, I said, Roshi, I don't understand. You recite the same thing at every wedding. You say to the man, you have married the perfect wife. And then you say to the uh, woman, you have married the perfect husband. You say that no matter who it is. He smiled at me mischievously and said, you don't understand? There's a story from um, uh, Mother Teresa in which she was being interviewed by Malcolm Muggridge, I think, the British philosopher on BBC in this whole series of interviews. And when he finished in interviewing her about all the work she did with orphans and dying people and so forth, and very, very moving, he said at one point, he said, uh, you know, still it must be easier for you because you're a nun. You don't have the complexities of life that we householders do. You don't have, you know, insurance policies and cars and, and you know, you're not married and so forth. And she said, no, 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 we have cars and I'm married too. And she held up the ring that was the symbolic, the symbol of the wedding to Christ. And she looked right in, him right in the eye and she said, and he can be very difficult sometimes. <laughs> right? So I tell this story when I marry people, um, as I do something about Suzuki Roshi's teaching about what's perfect, because the point isn't to find perfection in another person. You've tried that a long time, unsuccessfully, right? The point is to perfect your love the point of a relationship. And so if things go wrong and so forth, that's the place to really learn to love. Someone came and gave me this beautiful poem from the New York subway. My neighbor's musical instrument of choice is the door. <laughs> At first I thought it was a major nuisance. And then I saw it was really part of a kind of percussion sonata. And the aggravation dissolved and now I observe how skillful this soloist is in his entrance and exit. So, of course, you get annoyed with your neighbor or your partner or whatever. Um, and the mantra in relationship is this too. You know, well, I thought I'd be together with this person or that, and it was all right until we got to this. But this one is unacceptable. And then the sacred mantra is mm, this too, this too. That's it. And then you fight, right? And um, 
fight, mostly we fight because we think we're right. You know, a happy relationship is where each partner grants the possibility that the other may be right, (laughs) though neither really believes it, yes? Or it's like the timid student who went up to the teacher and said, I couldn't make out what you wrote on the margin of my paper, sir. And the teacher said, I told you to write more legibly. (laughs) It's so easy to judge that person because they're not acting the right way and not fulfilling the way it's supposed to be. And then when we really get activated in that way, we pull out our arsenal of weapons. And it's said that everybody is bequeathed a certain weaponry from your family heritage. You know, and for some it's sort of a short stiletto that you carry in your boot and just pull it out at the right moment. For some it's a broadsword. You know what the weaponry is and you know who you got it from. And then there's a certain moment where it gets really tough and then, you know, maybe not the weapons of mass destruction, but some of the intermediate level weapons start to come out. So what do you do with all of this? As um, Ed Brown writes... Always I insisted you alone were to blame. In this last instant, my eyes open and I regard you with all the tenderness and forgiveness I have withheld for so long. How does one use relationship? Yes, to meet needs, and needs are a part of life, and that's all right. But it can be so much more than that. To remind ourselves who we really are. Is it about being right or is it about being free? And people say, well, what about attachment in relationship? What if I get attached? There is a kind of healthy attachment and what it's called is commitment. Commitment isn't attachment that I need you or want you to be this certain way for me. That is attachment that makes suffering. And if you're attached that way to your child or your lover or whoever it is and you need them and want them to be a certain way, They won't like it because they want to be the way they are. On the other hand, commitment is the dedication to loving that person as you both grow, as you both grow and remember more and more deeply and fully who you really are. And through this commitment, there grows patience and compassion and the capacity for a kind intention, and the capacity to set boundaries, to say yes and no, and to care for one another, to care for oneself. Adrian Rich, the poet, says, an honorable human relationship is one in which two people can deepen the truths they tell to one another. This work is perhaps the hardest and most worthwhile spiritual task of all. That kind of intimacy. So a story I've told here before, but it seems fitting for Valentine's, happened on a retreat last year where I read this passage about love or compassion from Richard Selzer. Um, And so I read this at a retreat. Um, And early on in the retreat, a woman came up to me in the first interview that we had. And I said, how is the sitting going? She said, I'm just so angry. And I said, well, that's okay. Can you just sit and be angry and hold it with a spirit of mindfulness and compassion? You don't have to fix it or not be angry or judge it. Can you actually get curious? What is anger like? What's the story is tell? What, what does all this feel like in your body? You know, and instead of judging, can you feel this with compassion? And she, then she said, feel it. I'm so angry. It's all his fault. You know? I said, well, okay, so now you all also want to feel blame as well as anger, and that's okay in judgment and so forth. And she said, you know, we started this business, my husband and I, um, our children moved out, and we took our money and we started this business, and he's really irresponsible. He's not a very good business partner. He's not keeping up his end. He's not systematic with it and so forth. I'm afraid we're going to lose everything, you know, and I've talked to him all these times and he just didn't follow through on something and she was just, you know, I don't know what I'm, I'm at my wit's end. I'm so upset and angry. What should I do? So what would you tell her? I said, for right now, don't do anything. Just sit with it. I mean, first of all, I didn't know the answer. Um, but more than that, um, that wasn't, where she was. She was at a retreat. And the place, actually the point was to do nothing. 
except pay attention and listen with the spirit of attention, respect, and compassion. Yourself, another, all the stories of anger, you know all those stories told, you know, the righteousness of it and all that stuff. So anyway, in the course of the retreat, I gave this talk on loving kindness and I read one of my favorite stories from Richard Seltzer where he writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clown-like. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be this way from now on. The surgeons followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed in the evening lamplight, and I wonder who they are as they gaze at one another, touch each other so kindly. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods, is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. And all at once I know who he is. I understand and lower my gaze, for one is not bold in an encounter with the gods. And unaware of my presence, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. And I remember that the gods appeared in ancient Greece as mortals, and I hold my breath and let the wonder in. So I read that story, and then toward the end of the retreat, last day or two, this woman came to see me again, and uh, she looked a little better less upset and I said how are you doing and she said I answered my heart's question I said oh and then she wrote it actually in a little card which she read to me and gave to me (coughs) she said he's not a good business partner but he would kiss my crooked mouth and then she wept and she said I really know what I have I have a partner who loves me So what is relationship about? What is the goal of it? Is it to remember who we really are? To awaken? It's the potential of it. And Ramda says at one point, a lot of practices that seem really difficult become incredibly easy in the presence of love. To the extent that we allow the spirit of love to come more and more into ourselves, in our relationship, which is a generosity, which is a, this is the game. We're in it to awaken, to let each other blossom as best we can. What is your goal? Okay, so I get to read, if I can find it here, something that has, um, my daughter gave me from the internet, you know, one of those things that circulate around, funny stories. And I couldn't ever imagine how I could fit it into a talk on Monday night. And then it was Valentine's Day, and I thought, okay, I can sort of get away with it here. (laughs) So the following is a question given um, on a University of Toronto chemistry exam. Some of you have probably heard this. Um, And it was a bonus question at the end. It was a question about, um, partly about Boyle's Law and... um, Uh, which is that gas cools when it expands and it heats up when it's compressed. And the the kind of um, bonus question said, um, do you believe that hell is exothermic, gives off heat, or endothermic, absorbs heat? So students mostly didn't know what to do with that, but one student wrote this. He said, to solve this question, we need to know how the mass of hell is changing. So we need to know the rate at which souls are moving into hell. I think we can safely assume that once a soul gets there, it will not leave. Therefore, no souls are leaving. And as for how many souls are entering hell, most religions state that if you are not a member of their religion in good standing, you will go to hell. Since there is more than one of these religions, and since people do not belong to more than one religion, we can deduce that all souls will go to hell. (laughs) 
With birth rates as they are, we can expect the number of souls in hell to increase exponentially. Now, Boyle's law states that in order for the temperature and pressure of hell to stay the same, the volume of hell has to expand proportionately as souls are added. This gives two possibilities. If hell is expanding at a slower rate than the rate at which souls enter, then the temperature and pressure in hell will increase until all hell breaks loose. (laughs) If hell is expanding at a rate faster than the increase of souls entering, then the temperature and pressure will drop until hell freezes over. (laughs) So which is it? If we accept the postulate given to me by Teresa during my freshman year that it will be a cold day in hell before I sleep with you, (laughs) and take into account the fact that I slept with her last night, (laughs) then number two must be true. (laughs) And thus I am sure that hell is exothermic and is already frozen over. The corollary of this theory is that since hell is frozen over, it follows that it is not accepting any more souls, leaving only heaven, thereby proving the existence of a divine being, which explains why last night Teresa kept shouting, Oh my God. (laughs) Okay. So we've done, thank you, Caroline. We've done (laughs) desire and the middle path and using relationship, uh, the difference between attachment and commitment. Can you feel the difference? And now we're to sexuality. Oh, nobly born. Sexuality is such an amazing, mysterious dance of being alive. If you look and listen carefully, this whole life is so mysterious. I mean, who does it happen to? Who are you in there that got into this body and are hearing these words? And if you look and say, who am I? Am I this body or these feelings or thoughts? They're all changing like a river. Well, maybe I'm the one who's aware of this. But even when you look deeply into the awareness, what you see is there's this kind of amorphous space of knowing that is open and generous and easy and allowing for good movies and bad movies and everything in between, you know, comedies and tragedies. And then you look in the mirror and say, wow, that was quite a year, wasn't it? That one. It's the place that neither grows nor gets stuck or changes. It is that which was there before you were born. It is your own true nature. So then, looking from the place of this mystery, we kind of regard incarnation. And incarnation is a really weird thing. You get a physical body. One of my teachers called it the meat body, right? Bones and meat, you know, and a little makeup on top of it, basically. Um, And how do you get in here? Through through sex, through procreation. You know, maybe it's test tube babies, but even so, there's some procreation involved in that in some fashion or other. And I find it so interesting, especially when you encounter other forms of life. I remember swimming with the dolphins and having this great big eye, you know, come right up to me and look, um, you know, and then holding on and being carried around, uh, you know, the salt water in this bay that where we were swimming, and how fantastic it was. And it was clear that this was a being who was really interested and probably knew as much as I did in other ways, many more um, things that I didn't. Or I remember going to visit Coco, who is the one of the gorillas that's been taught sign language, who lived in Palo Alto for a long time at the um, uh, Gorilla Foundation, I guess it's called. And when we went, my daughter Caroline was young then. She was, I don't know, maybe eight years old. And we went with one of the sign language teachers for Coco. And we walked across this grassy lawn and got up to Coco there <clears throat> before we went in. And Coco sm- seemed happy, seemed like smiled or something to see this woman teacher that was a friend and signing. And, and then the teacher introduced us. This is Jack and Liana and Caroline, my daughter. And Coco signed something like, hello, and then pretty flowers. I don't know the sign for pretty flowers, but anyway. And we looked around, and there weren't any flowers. It was just kind of grass and trees, and kind of quizzical. 
and then the woman who brought us up there said, what do you mean, Coco? And Coco signed pretty flowers again and looked at my daughter. And sure enough, she had this little dress on with little floral print on it. You know, like, nice dress, right? <laughs> it's quite fantastic, okay? So who are we? We get into these bodies, you know, which I talk about. One end, there's a hole into which you stuff dead plants and animals a few times a day, <laughs> grind them up and kind of push them through the tube. And then we reproduce ourselves by sticking one part of one body into another part and secreting cells and, you know, the whole... Haven't you ever stopped in the middle of it and said, this is really weird? <laughs> I mean, it's fun. It's wonderful. It's just great. But it's also mysterious. It is. And then in a woman's body grows an entire other person. I mean, and then if you're there at a birth, it's the most phenomenal thing to see here's another person coming onto the planet. Absolutely phenomenal. So sex is such a big thing because it's, it's so deeply connected with where we come from, with who we really are. It is the, the powerful energy and drive, again, like gravity, to make more of life, for consciousness to reappear again in one form after another. It's also powerful because it's one of the few places in life where there's natural samadhi. You know, we live so distracted in our lives. And then, especially orgasm, as in French, when it's called the petit mot, when it's the little death, there's a certain way in which, whether it is in sexual union or whether it is in other very special times, maybe listening to the most beautiful piece of music, or maybe for some people it's just at the time of death, There's some very special times in which the sense of who we think we are dissolves into something greater. We lose ourself. And there's this natural wholeness and samadhi and awakening. And we crave it in a certain way, not just for the desire of it, but to get out of ourselves to something greater, to remember who we really are. There's that longing for another person and then that longing for union and that longing to lose ourselves in something that is this this wholeness of love. Sasaki Roshi, a Rinzai Zen master still teaching down in Los Angeles now, I think Joshu Sasaki is 96 years old or something like that. Um, And uh, a couple of friends of mine who were students of his for some years were struggling with Zen practice and having a family, doing their retreats, having a family and marriage and being really busy. And they went to the Roshi, to the Zen master, and complained at one point and said, you know, our marriage has kind of lost its um, spark. We, you know, we don't have a sexual connection much anymore. It's just like work. We come and we do our Zen practice. We take care of our kid. But it feels like we're just falling apart and we're going to end up in divorce. And the Zen master said, oh, not so good. You need to practice and you need to work with this. He said, I want you both to come on Sashin, on retreat. And he worked by giving people koans to solve, like what is the sound of one hand clapping or bring me a pearl from the bottom of the sea without getting wet. And these are great kind of Zen puzzles. Um, and he brought them in. He said, I want you to share a room on this retreat and I want you to come and see me three times a day to answer your koan. He would see people three or four times every day to get your answer for the koan. Um, and here's the koan I give you as a couple. How do you manifest Buddha while making love? So your instructions are to sit for an hour, walk for an hour, and then go make love. And then come in and answer the koan, you know, and then go back and sit and walk and make love again and come back until you can answer this. How do you become Buddha while making love? I thought that was a pretty cool retreat myself. (laughs) Now, on the other hand, you know, so one could say, oh, that's the way I want to do it, you know. Um, On the other hand, um, there, so there are people who use sexuality and connection in order to come to the divine. And it's a beautiful thing. 
And then there are those who say, I don't need that. I, I have another avenue or another way to do it. Um, Rabia, great Sufi, Islamic saint, um, um, she was uh, and poet. Um, she was beautiful and ecstatic and revered by all kinds of people. And the emir, like the sultan of Basra, you now know where Basra is from the news, right? Um, decided that he wanted to marry her. And he offered her his kingdom. And she wrote him this letter back, I'm not interested really in possessing all you own, nor in your possessing me, nor in making you my slave, nor in having my attention distracted from God for even a split second. And she went on, Control yourself. Don't let others control you. Instead, share your inheritance with them and suffer like they do the common suffering of time. And as you act, remember the day of your death. And as for me, whatever bride price you can come up with, understand the God I worship can double it. Thank you, Rabia. <laughs> I remember asking um, one very great Tibetan Lama, Karmapa, who was celibate about tantra and sexuality and celibacy and so forth. And, um, you know, why was he celibate? And his answer was, I'm celibate for the same reason that you are not because it makes me happy. He said, I already feel so connected, so alive in my love for all things. I don't seek it in any way. Sexuality is just, I mean, just falls away for him. Okay, that's one way, right? I remember when I was sitting on retreat as a monk, trying to be celibate and so forth, and here I was, 22, 23 years old, it was not easy as a young man. And I'd be sitting, following my breath, and feeling what's going on in my body and mind. And in fact, what happened is I would sit there and have all these erotic fantasies. Um, and so I tried to be mindful of them, erotic fantasy, a fantasy, fantasy, and then I would just get into them for a while. And, okay, but then, you know, after some hours, it's time back to go to the back to my breath. I'm, I'm not just here to do, you know, reruns of erotic fantasies and so forth. And I asked my teacher about it and he said, oh good, pay attention. Try to just be mindful of that too. It's part of the energy of life. You know, whether you choose to act on it or not, what matters is can you be present, open your heart to this mystery of life. So there I am, being celibate but not really wanting to be in some, some part of me. And as I paid attention, they just kept coming over and over, over and over and over. So many fantasies. And finally I complained. I said, it's just I pay attention and nothing happens and I'm just lost in them and so forth. And he said, pay closer attention. <coughs> and notice especially what happens before the erotic fantasy arises. Just notice the moments right before it. So I sat there and sure enough, you know, this fantasy started to come again, began to think about something, some experience I'd had or imagined I wanted to have. And then I noticed, oh, how interesting. Right before it came, I was feeling uncomfortable. And what was that feeling? Oh, I was really lonely. Here I was half a world away in my little hut in the woods, you know, meditating away. And I don't like being lonely. I hate it, actually. It's very unpleasant. You know, it's something, something that... I think that I, as I've said, um, I have a twin brother and I have a feeling that I even had the idea that if I had to get born, I was going to have a partner, you know, in the womb. We kind of, so I wouldn't even be lonely when I came into this life. Anyway, so loneliness has been a theme for me and there it is. Oh yeah, almost every time the fantasy came, before it came this deep sense of loneliness. And then when I explored that, I began to have to explore with the help of my teacher the difference between loneliness and aloneness. The loneliness where I really felt like this is who I am in this skin. You know, that my identity was really small and I needed a break out of it and the way to do it was with another person or something. And then as I let the loneliness open and say, all right, I'll die of loneliness. I'll just feel this loneliness as bad as it gets, as big as it is. It got bigger and bigger and opened and opened. And at some point... It got very peaceful. It was kind of interesting. Oh, loneliness and space. 
And then all of a sudden I realized it wasn't lonely anymore. It was just being, it was just space. And there wasn't an inside or outside or me and another. There was just being. And there was this sweet sense of aloneness that came that was alone with everything. I don't know how to describe it better than that. But you know what I mean, how sexuality is actually a mirror. It's not the sex itself or the eros, but that it becomes a reflection for needs or fears or insecurities or wants or or hopes or loneliness or longing or all those things get reflected in it. I mean, one young Tibetan Lama I was talking to about it, he said, you Americans are so neurotic about it. We Tibetans just do it, right? And you have all these ideas about it. So for householders, the teachings around sexuality are that it is a neutral energy and that it can be associated with that which is unskillful from the extremes of rape and aggression to greed and, you know, the misuse of sexuality and the causing of suffering. The basic teaching is to refrain from those actions that cause suffering to yourself or another person through misuse of sexuality. I, when I teach this precept, I usually ask, how many people in the room have made idiots of yourself in your sex life? And then, of course, I don't need to have anybody raise their hands because we know the answer. Um, so on one side, the energy can be used in unskillful ways to cause suffering for ourselves or another or be lost in it or, or worse. <coughs> And on the other side, it can be associated with communion and sharing and the breaking open of boundaries and the intimacy and love and the mystery of life. I was on a panel on sexuality and spirituality in the city some years ago with Allen Ginsberg, Sultra Malioni, who's this Tibetan Lama, Louisa Teach, Teach who is a kind of Yoruba priestess, um, And it was interesting because we talked a lot about sexuality. Nobody mentioned love for a long time. It was just about sex. And then finally somebody in the audience jumped up and said, wait, what about love? Anything in our life can be used to awaken. And one of the most powerful forces for awakening is to take the intimacy of our relationships, eros, sexuality, caring for one another, and use this as a place to find true freedom and true love. It is upon our vulnerability, says Rilke, it is upon our vulnerability that we depend. And to love, in a way, is to make yourself vulnerable. And yet, at the same strange time, it also means to become invulnerable. There are two great powers of humans on this earth, the power of those who are unafraid to kill and the power of those who are unafraid to love. So love is this enormous power and at the same time it has this tenderness and vulnerability in it which allows us to know our connection with another. As a poet Maxine Kuhlman writes, God, the rabbis tell us, never assigns exalted office to a human until she has tested their true metal in small things. So it is written that when a lamb escaped the flock, Moses came upon it at a brook drinking its fill and said, I would have taken thee in my arms and carried thee here had I known thy thirst. And then a heavenly voice warmly said, Ah, you are fit for the work of the heart. There's an intimacy and a care and a tenderness that we can bring to small things and great things alike. And you could call this tantra, if you will. It's the tantra of taking connection and desire and beauty and love and eros and saying, yes, I will make this into the place of awakening, the place of freedom and good intention and the openness of a heart and the deep connection with one another. George Washington Carver wrote, anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. The vulnerability of the heart, the willingness to do that. 
And we see it. We see the power of it in those who truly love around us. What an amazing spirit it is in all its levels. My teacher Nisargadot used to say, wisdom says I am nothing and love says that I am everything. Between these two, my life flows. In a certain way, you meditate and you get more and more empty and you see that this small skin encapsulated ego is not who you are. It's just a costume. You wear it for a while and it changes, you know. You have to put more makeup on it as it goes along. It's just how it is on stage, right? And you get your turns acting tragedy and comedy and all the roles are given, but it's not our true identity. Wisdom sees I'm nothing, that this is just the play of life itself. And love says I am everything. Love sees I am everything. And between these two, my life flows. When love sees I'm everything, it's really this deep connection with the world. Now, the last thing before a poem to end is about mm, 15 years ago or so, because I'd been involved in this topic or 20 years ago, I did a survey uh, because there was a lot of questions about the misconduct of Buddhist teachers and misusing their role and, and... you know, you taking advantage of students sexually or various other things, those stories, you know, and how could this happen? And I wrote an article for Yoga Journal um, after I did a survey in which I talked to 52 different Buddhist teachers about their sexual lives. And what the survey, when I collected the information, came out to show was that of the 52 teachers, 39 were sexually active. Only a dozen or 13 of them were celibate. And that everything that you could imagine was in there. Some were celibate and happy. Some were celibate and miserable. Some were in relationship and happy. Some were in relationship and miserable. There were heterosexual relationships. There were homosexual relationships. There were transvestites. There were fetishes. There was... um, people who were monogamous and happy. There were people who were monogamous and unhappy. There were people who were having affairs. Basically, anything that you could see about human sexuality was being enacted in some way by these 52 Buddhist teachers. And as best as I could tell, they didn't have it any more together than anybody else. So it's one thing to get enlightened sitting on your meditation cushion or wherever you were in the temple. And then it's another to take the spirit of the heart of awakening and say, all right, let me bring this in an honorable way to my love, to my relationships, to my care for one another. And that, in some way, is really the great task on this earth. Not just the emptiness, but to bring this beauty into form. So the last poem from Zen Master E.Q., who was a love to write about Eros. Long life, the wild pines want it too. Passion's red thread is infinite, like the earth always under me. I'm Steventy, still alive, looking up every night, snapping my fingers at time at the promise of love. Here he is, still alive and erotic and loving at 70. I'd love to give you something too, but what would help? Self, other, right, wrong. Waste your life arguing. Face it. You're happy. Really happy you are. Don't worry, please. How many times do I have to say it? There is no way not to be who you are and where. Don't worry, please. How many times do I have to say it? There is no way not to be who you are and where. So let's sit for a moment.
Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.